This is the VOA Special English Health Report. Translators Without Borders is an American nonprofit group. It provides language services to non governmental organizations such as, yes, Doctors Without Borders. The group recently trained some new translators in Nairobi in how to put health information into local languages for Kenyans. For health translators, finding the right words is not just about language, but also culture. Muthoni Kishohi is a manager for Family Health Options Kenya, the group that organized the training. She says she has no problem expressing the names of body parts in English. But as a Kikuyu, she says there are some words in her first language that may be provocative if she said them in public. She says she often has to change the wording of the information. Trainer Paul Walrambo says the same issue arises with Kenya's national language. He says People are sometimes forced to use euphemisms, speaking in a language that is more acceptable to the listener. The culture of a community will largely decide how words and expressions are translated into socially acceptable language. In some cases, the way people in a culture think about an activity or object becomes the translated name for that activity or object. For example, Paul Warambo says that in Kiswahili, the common translation for the term sexual intercourse is to do something bad. Whether or not a community will accept or even listen to a message is especially important in healthcare. Lori Thick co founded Translators Without Borders in 1993. She says, in general, a lot of development organizations have often overlooked the importance of language in changing health behavior. Lori Thick says, People generally do not think of translation. But she says it is important when sharing information, whether it is how to take medicine or where to find supplies in a crisis situation. Muthoni Kishohi and her team recently opened a health information center in a Maasai community. She learned that young Maasai cannot say some things in the presence of their leaders. Also, men are usually the ones who speak at public gatherings, so people might not accept a message given by a woman. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. You can find more stories about health at voaspecialenglish.com. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. Even a small reduction in salt in the diet can be a big help to the heart. A new study used a computer model to predict how just three grams less a day would affect heart disease in the United States. The result? 13% fewer heart attacks, 8% fewer strokes, 4% fewer deaths, 11% fewer new cases of heart disease, and $240 billion in health care savings. Researchers found it could prevent 100,000 heart attacks and 92,000 deaths every year. The study is in the New England Journal of Medicine. Kirsten Bibbins-Domingo, 
at the University of California, San Francisco, was the lead author. She says people would not even notice a difference in taste with three grams or one-half teaspoon less salt per day. The team also included researchers at Stanford and Columbia University. Each gram of salt contains 400 milligrams of sodium, which is how foods may list their salt content. The government says the average American man eats 10 grams of salt a day. The American Heart Association advises no more than 3 grams for healthy people. It says salt in the American diet has increased 50 percent since the 1970s, while blood pressures have also risen. Less salt can mean a lower blood pressure. New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg is leading an effort called the National Salt Reduction Initiative. The idea is to put pressure on food companies and restaurants. Critics call it government interference. Mayor Bloomberg has already succeeded in other areas, like requiring fast food places in the city to list calorie information. Now, a study by the Seattle Children's Research Institute shows how that idea can influence what parents order for their children. Ninety-nine parents of three to six-year-olds took part. Half had McDonald's menus clearly showing how many calories were in each food. The other half got menus without the calorie information. Parents given the counts chose an average of 102 fewer calories when asked what they would order for their children. Yet there was no difference in calories between the two groups for foods that the parents would have chosen for themselves. Study leader Pooja Tandon says even small calorie reductions on a regular basis can prevent weight gain over time. The study was published in the journal Pediatrics. And that's the VOA Special English Health Report. What do you think is a government's duty on issues like salt or fats? Let us know at voaspecialenglish.com. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. Not all cheaters are creative, but apparently enough creative people cheat to interest researchers like Francesca Gino. Professor Gino is a behavioral economist at the Harvard Business School in Massachusetts. There are actually a lot of examples in the literature, novels, movies, comic books about this idea of the evil genius, but really no empirical evidence for this relationship. Behavioral economists use ideas from psychology to study how people make economic choices. Professor Gino tested volunteers to see how creative they were. Then, she tested them in situations involving small amounts of money, where they could earn extra by cheating. For example, they took a test and had to copy their answers onto another paper. But on that other paper, the correct answers were already lightly marked, supposedly by mistake. The test takers knew they would earn more for correct answers. They were led to believe they could cheat without getting caught. The results showed that the more creative people were more likely to cheat. By comparison, People who were more intelligent but less creative were not more likely to cheat. Professor Gino says creative people are better at creating excuses 
to justify their actions to themselves. What we find is that that creativity leads people to be more morally flexible. So they are much more able to come up with justification for the behavior that they're about to engage in. And as a result, they are more likely to cheat. She says workplaces that value creativity also create openings for that moral flexibility. Original thinkers may be less likely to follow all the rules. We think that creativity really helps people resolve this conflict between something that is more longer term, which is the idea of being good and moral, and then something that is more short term, which is the idea of advancing your own self-interest. And that does not necessarily mean getting money out of cheating, but it could also be getting other types of pleasures or utilities. The study shows the dark side of creativity. So it's not that we are trying to say that people shouldn't be creative. We are trying to say that they should be creative, but they should be thinking about the fact that their creativity can be used for the wrong reasons. Her research with Dan Ariely at Duke University appears in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. Twenty years ago, President George H.W. Bush signed a civil rights law called the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA. Congress passed the law to bar discrimination against people with physical or mental disabilities. The ADA governs employers, transportation systems, and public places, including hotels and other businesses. In New York City, the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities co-hosted a celebration on June 26th to mark the anniversary. Hip-hop artist Rick Fire says conditions are far better than they were 20 years ago. But he says being in a wheelchair is still often a problem in his neighborhood in the Bronx area of the city. Matthew Sapolin is commissioner of the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, and he is blind. His job is to try to improve life for disabled New Yorkers. This includes things like adding ramps and handrails in buildings, and signs written in Braille in elevators. Bobby Wales developed polio before a vaccine became available in the 1950s. She was 12 years old. Schools then were not designed for wheelchairs. She had to be tutored at home three days a week. After high school, she got a job in one of the few workplaces with wheelchair accessible bathrooms. She worked at a hospital for 30 years, mostly as an administrator. Bobby Wales also fought for passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. She said, Disability doesn't care if you're young, old, rich, poor, black, white, green, or purple. Disability will always be here, unfortunately. So it behooves all of us to make it a world that everybody can live in. Even with the ADA, a lot of work remains to reach the goal of equality for the disabled, and not just in America. Marca Bristow heads a group called the United States International Council on Disabilities. 
She was paralyzed at the age of 23. She broke her neck diving into a lake. She said people with disabilities are living in the streets in some countries. Some people believe they have been possessed by the devil. They are a shame to their families. They are left to live subhuman lives. And that's the VOA Special English Health Report. To comment on this report, go to our website, voaspecialenglish.com. You can also watch a TV report on the 20th anniversary of the ADA. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at VOA Learning English. This is the VOA Special English Health Report. Not all spies target military, political, or economic intelligence. Some spies gather medical intelligence. Presidents, prime ministers, and other leaders do not always like to talk about their health. Some disappear from public life for a while and then reappear with or without an explanation. Spy agencies search for information about physical and mental health. The idea that a leader might even lose his mind and launch a war or a nuclear attack is not an imaginary threat. The Central Intelligence Agency has a medical and psychological assessment cell. It employs or consults with doctors, sociologists, political scientists, and cultural anthropologists to examine the conditions of top officials. Jonathan Clementi is a doctor doing research for a book on medical intelligence. He says the CIA team will look for psychiatric signs, then describe for the policymakers how someone with that particular set of findings may react to certain situations. Such efforts go back to the Office of Strategic Services, which came before the CIA. The OSS did a psychological profile of Nazi leader Adolf Hitler in Germany. The CIA was established in 1947. Dr. Clementi says the agency formed a small office called Leadership at a Distance. In the late 50s and early 1960s, the CIA decided that they had expertise to look more carefully and in a more rigorous analytical way at the health of foreign leaders. The idea is to help give policymakers some forewarning of a transition in a government and also to look for potential points of diplomatic leverage. Experts say dying leaders can feel they have to act quickly to make sure their decisions live longer than they do. Physical and mental health are closely linked, experts say. But identifying a mental condition without direct examination of a person can be much more difficult than a physical disorder. Rose McDermott is a political psychologist at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. She says an illness like bipolar disorder can be well controlled on medication, but a leader's behavior can also be affected by treatment for a physical condition. The concern is not just the illness, it's also the medication that people take while they are ill and how that can compromise their decision-making ability cognitively and intellectually. So they don't make the same kind of decisions. Their decisions may not be as predictable. They certainly may not be as quote-unquote rational. For VOA Special English, 
I'm Alex Villarreal.